and welcome to the second edition of Micro Live. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that this is the month in which British Telecom goes private. By way of comparison, Fred reports on the great upheavals that have been taking place in the American telephone system. I'll be talking to Chris Palmer, welcome Chris, about a new range of computers just appearing in the shops, all with the mysterious label MSX. Did you know that this and this can do irreparable harm to these? Micro Live investigates. You've done the right thing or not? Do you? And we'll be finding out which computer superstar Brian Jacks eventually did buy for himself and his family. First, though, a large thank you to all those who sent us in messages about last month's show. We've had hundreds on our bulletin board, on Micronet and the Telecom Gold Electronic Mail Service, and, of course, on good old snail mail. Uh, Steve Robinson, for instance, has sent us a message here. Congratulations on a live programme. Why does Micro Live have to be so early in the evening? I have to record it so that it's micro not so live. Keep up the good work, though. Well, thanks, Steve, anyway. Well, for anyone missing the show at the moment, but the good news is that you can miss it again tomorrow, that Saturday afternoon on BBC Two, because we have a repeat at 2.50. We'll be tired if they do. Well, our apologies to you if you try dialing into our micro live bulletin board in the few days after last month's show. We took a while to get it going because we had all our discs stolen shortly after the transmission. And there's a moral there. Being professionals, we always make backup copies of our discs. But unfortunately, we kept them in the same place as our master discs and the whole lot were nicked. Now, to make sure you keep them in the same place yourself, we'll be reminding you about the bulletin board later on. Well, a number of you, including Quentin North and Ian Beebe, have been asking us to show machines other than the BBC Micro. Well, of course, we are going to do that starting now. And with good reason, because this month has seen a number of new products from Sinclair. There's, first of all, a new version of the Spectrum. Here it is. It's the Spectrum Plus. The pluses are a new keyboard and a £50 rise in price. Nevertheless, to be honest, this is an improvement on the old rubber keys. And Sinclair's pocket-sized flat-screen TV has just appeared. Uh, I'll switch it on. It really does have a picture. It's just a pity that it hasn't got an input suitable for a computer. So, although it's fine for match of the day, it's no good for programming under the bedclothes, which is rather a pity. You nice, have a very good eyesight to see that if you're using it for a computer. You do. I wonder if they supply the very good eyesight along with the telemac. <laughs> well, until now, the only micro that's had a teletext decoder has been the BBC micro. But there's a new add-on, here it is, which enables Spectrum users to get CFAX or Oracle on their ordinary television sets or even on their monitors. For instance, here we are. That should be the news coming up in a minute. The extra that you gain over a normal teletext set is the ability to save the pages into your computer's memory and then print them out. At present, there are no programmes that you can download and run automatically on your Spectrum in the way that you could do with a BBC machine, but if there is enough demand, the editor of CFAX tells us that they will certainly look into broadcasting free telesoftware for the Spectrum. So, make a lot of noise if you want this to happen. Well, we were glad to see this new British plotter launched yesterday as an actual product in the market. It's a very clever device as accuracy is achieved by ingenious software rather than expensive hardware as you can see if you look at it it's got three color pens here and little wheels and so on except for about 200 pounds i'll be looking at it in more detail next month well if you buy hi-fi equipment from different manufacturers you'd expect them to fit together cassette players tuners amplifiers record players and so on and your cassettes or records would work on your friend's machine whoever made it well, that's not true for computers. Disk drives, for example, can't be interchanged between different makes of computers. And software for one machine won't run on another without some sort of change. Well, a new range of computers, MSX, has just been launched, which tries to get over these problems. Chris, tell us about MSX. Well, MSX actually stands for Microsoft Extended Basic. And the basic that's in all of these computers is an extended version of Microsoft's 4.5. Now, what has happened is over 20 Japanese companies, I mean, the large household names, people like Sony, JVC, and Hitachi, have got together and decided on a standard for their computers. That's for a standard for both software and hardware. For both, the, yes, for both the software and the hardware. Can so, you imagine seeing the BBC and, and uh, S S Sinclair with the Spectrum and Atari and Commodore all getting in one room and agreeing on a standard well, for software and hardware? Yes, I think you can referee that particular <laughs> match. But the, obviously the big advantage of this is that you can swap the, both the hardware and the peripherals between computers. So, for instance, I've got a boxing game running in this 
old star MSX computer at the moment, and if I uh, pull it out, it's a bit of a tight fit, I can in fact plug it into the Toshibo one, and hopefully after it's gone through its power-up message. That's a ROM cartridge? That's a ROM cartridge. Now you can see the same piece of software is now running on the Toshiba machine. So the software throughout the range is going to be compatible on also the hardware. So for instance, if you buy a Gold Star MSX and you decide you don't like the Gold Star joystick, you can go and buy uh, the Toshiba joystick and it'll plug straight into this side of your, yeah, the Gold Star or any of the other of the MSX computers. Well, we all know what compatibility means in computer jargon. It means they're incompatible. <laughs> How compatible is this really? Oh, it's, it's fairly compatible. We did have one problem, which was with this rather wonderful Sony joystick, which is um, an infrared joystick, uh, which obviously runs on the Sony. But when we tried to plug it into some of the other computers, we found it was a bit difficult to get the actual plugs into the side of the computer. So, yes, I mean, compatible it. What other equipment's available? Well, I mean, obviously, you've got the other standard peripherals. You've got things like uh, this matrix printer, which is from Toshiba, um, a very nice little full-color plotter printer from Sony, and a JVC disk drive. So once again, they all plug into the various machines and they'll all work with each other. Well, it's not good having all this equipment without software. What, no. What's that like? Well, at the moment, seeing as how the machines themselves are quite early, you know, quite early on the marketplace, the software is mainly games. And it ranges from some quite nice software, like we've got a, a rather wonderful Penguin game running on this, to some quite awful software. But at least some more serious software is coming along. For instance, we've got um, a fourth, we've got a home budget, and even a cassette-based word processor, which is uh, <laughs> not what I'm, I'd be into. Of course, yeah. the advantage is that the dealer only has to stock one set of software for all these different sorts of equipment. And, of course, anybody who has an MSX, whoever made it, they can swap their software around with their mates mm. and, of course, swap, swap the hardware. What are the new equipment is there? Well, I mean, one of the nice things, because um, obviously the MSX computers are being made by hi-fi manufacturers, is they've applied similar thought behind the thing. So you're buying the same computer and it will you know, run the same software and the same peripherals but you'll buy it mainly for the extra bits and pieces you can get with it. So, for instance, we have a Mitsubishi TV printer here, which will display what's on your TV screen. Uh, JVC video disc, which interacts with the computer. And nice we'll for games, really advanced games. Yes. And, and for education, I guess. Yes, and we'll be actually be looking at that on next month's show. But the thing which really yeah, it sort of turns me on, if you like, about MSX, is what Yamaha have done to theirs. Now, what Yamaha have done is they've made some additions to the basic MSX machine. And what they've done is, underneath it, they've put an FM synthesizer module. So you've virtually got a polyphonic syn synthesizer built in. Uh, you buy it with an add-on keyboard. And it's also got software built into ROM inside it. So you can just turn the computer on and type call music. And instantly, you're into the music software. And so, for instance, this way it's set up at the moment gives me a polyphonic brass sound down here. <laughs> and a phonic brass sound up the top. And you can connect the big uh, ordinary keyboards as well. Yeah, so it's MIDI compatible, so it'll connect upwards into more professional music hardware. But also, they're doing a lot to sort of cater for the more advanced musically-minded person. And for instance, this cartridge holds a music composer package. So if I turn this on and let it go through its power-up, what this will allow you to do is to go, using this keyboard, to input notes directly onto the stave on the screen. So if I can... Just quickly type a few notes and you see what I mean. So that's the notes in, and then you can ask it to play it back. A very powerful system. So summing up, it's a good idea for the dealers, it's a good idea for the actual users. The software's a bit naff at the present time. But it'll get better. It'll get better, I'm sure it will. Well, thank you very much, Chris. We'll let you know about the music. <laughs> yes, <later on>. all <laughs> right. Excited. Jilly and I really decided on the Atari for several different reasons. Firstly, we found that quite a lot of the shops stock and supply uh, Atari software and hardware, in fact. Oh, look at this. There's nothing else in that box there. Be careful. Be Secondly, Julie found that the machine was very neat. The keyboard was very easy to use. The whole thing is good looking in any case. Oh, that's okay. That's good. We also found there's a very quick system with the Atari where 
you can plug in a cot into the top and it comes up on the screen almost instantly. Oh, one minute, let's have a look. There you are. There's something good in here. Last of all, I think very importantly, that the, the graphics are absolutely excellent. I thought you wanted uh, Pac-Man, was it? When we first got the machines out of the box, we were both rather surprised at uh, the amount of wires that were hanging around. To find where they all plug in together took us about three quarters of an hour, I think. This is having a plug on here. Yeah, I don't often see that, do you? Must be, uh... yeah, the one goes to the television. Okay, we've got all plugged in. It's all set up now. Mm. All we've got is ready on the screen. Where do we go? <laughs> I don't know. Where Try do this. Know? What about this? Right. This should tell you something. Oh, here we are. Self-test menu. That looks like it. Mm. To begin the test, hold down the option key. I'm always telling you, type in B Y E. So I do that. What's the option key? Or hold down the option key. Oh, or hold press down. return. Ah, there's a self-test. It says memory. Audio, visual, keyboard, Daddy, that's or all what tests. I want. You want to have a go at that one? Which uh, one would you like to have a go? Keyboard. Keyboard. Select, I think it is. Is that a keyboard? Oh, that's keyboard, there. So you sit down and have a listen. So now it says press start. Start. That's that one start there. Yes. Oh, that's the keyboard. Now you have to mm. press the letters in there. Press F for Apple. Oh. F, no, F for press Apple. Um, now press F for Apple first, see uh. if it's working. Yeah, well, look, A comes up on the board, see it? A, <laughs> press it again. S for sun. D OK, now I'll tell you what we do. Mm. It says reset or help to exit. So if we press help, shall we have a look at another one? Yeah. Press select, all tests, memory. Daddy. What about audio visual? Let's see what that one says. Press start for me, that's that, that button there. Boom. Oh, music. <laughs> OK, well, let's see where we're up to. We've, we've got the, the machine going, the recorder going. We've got ready up on the screen. We've had a look at some of the uh, self-tests that you can do in the book. But the amazing thing is they haven't even given me a cassette with the machine to play through, so we can't really go any further from here. Also, it amazes me that they say in the brochures here, and you see a nice picture of the television and the, the computer together. When you actually get it set up, you know what you end up with? You end up with boxes and it's like Spaghetti Junction now. I don't know I'm going to hide all these. Anyhow, I think um, now I've got to go out and buy a cassette to put in the machine, and I think that's only just the beginning. Well, best of luck, Brian. We'll come back to you next month and see how you really get on. We've drawn up a list of questions to ask yourself and to ask the shop when buying a micro. These are included in the notes you can get from the bulletin board, from electronic mail, or from the address we'll give you at the end of the programme. Well, if you've just bought a micro, you're probably loading and saving programmes on cassette tape, something like this. However, to get at a particular piece of information, you have to run through the tape in sequence until you find it, and this can take an awful long time. Now, there are some ways of speeding up this process, and one of them is by using what are called floopies. That's one of these, and if I open it carefully, you'll be able to see inside what it is. And all it is is a loop of tape placed in this cartridge, and this enables it to be driven across the reading heads very much faster than the tr traditional cassette. In fact, it operates at about ten times the speed of an ordinary cassette, but it's still sequential so it runs one after the other and if you want to load programs quickly or reach data you need a storage medium which gives you what's known as random access that's the techie term today well the most common of these is the floppy disk and I'm sure many of you have seen things like this this is a three and a half inch disk five inch disk and an eight inch disk and they go from a hundred thousand to well over a million characters if we open one and I don't recommend you do this you'll see why they call floppies and obviously the information is held magnetically on the surface of this floppy disk and it's accessed as it's spun round. It looks a bit like a gramophone record and in fact the analogy works quite well. How do you find that information? Well,
gramophone record has a catalogue in the middle. And if you look here, track four, barber, adagio for strings. And if you want to play that, you simply take the head, one, two, three, four, place it on there, and somewhere you get adagio for strings. Well, a disc actually works in rather a similar way, except the catalogue is stored on one of the tracks of the disc, like this. And that has an address of which track the head should go to, and then, as the disc turns around, which sector your data is stored in, or which data, which sector the data starts, and then you read it in. So, any serious computer user will soon turn to discs, but they do have their problems. Don't say a word, but we've been hearing rumours of corruption on the tube trains. Not that London transport staff have been taking bribes. No, it's all to do with these floppy disks. Now, floppy disks are a marvellous way of storing computer data, but they do need careful handling. And there are some dire warnings on the packet. They advise you here not to touch, not to bend, not to heat or freeze, and above all, to avoid magnets. Oh, excuse me, I think this is my train. So, what am I doing on a London tube train? Well, some people say that the magnetic fields generated by the powerful electric motors can corrupt disks. That is, they can damage the data that you've probably spent four days typing in. We wondered whether this was true and whether there are other ways that you can accidentally damage disks. We decided to investigate by using seven identical disks onto which we've recorded a sequence of programs. Now, this is disk number one. In order to give it maximum exposure, I'm going to put it as close to the track as possible. We left disc number two in the BBC canteen freezer for 24 hours. That's well below the minimum temperature recommended. A disc left near the screen of a TV or monitor can easily be damaged because of the large magnetic field that's induced around the tube when the set's switched on. So, I'll switch this one on and off a couple more times for good measure. And that's disc number three. Oh, a couple of other tips. It's not wise to switch the system off with a disc left in the drive and also never write on the label of the disc with a biro. We were also wondering whether the strong magnet in a loud speaker coil could damage discs, so we have subjected disc number four to five hours of non-stop Barry Manilow at full volume. probably his agent. It's not so obvious that the bells in a telephone create a large magnetic field, so we have left disc number five under here for the last few days, and I'll add that to the collection. London Airport? test number six, these airport x-ray machines. Years ago, these machines would use a powerful continuous x-ray beam, which would literally cook your holiday films just like that. Now, some airports, Malta, for example, still use them to be warned. But these more modern machines, they simply take an x-ray snapshot of your bag. Bye. The X-ray generator is activated for a fraction of a second. And don't be fooled that you can't see the floppy disk on the monitor. It is there, but it's not dense enough to register. Now, the manufacturers of this machine are so confident that it won't corrupt disks that they've agreed to run disk number six through the machine 1,000 times. Number seven. Oh. <laughs> and this is the very disc that went on that pub crawl. It has since been washed under the cold tap and allowed to dry. So I'll just load it and see what I'll sort of state it's, it's in. Work. Are you placing your bets, Mac? I am. Um, Let's have a look at the. Look at that. Not even a hiccup after all that beer. Oh, it couldn't have been Heineken. Yes, that would have reached everywhere. I know what you're trying to say. <laughs> Do you know, that is surprising because that means.
six out of the seven discs that we used and abused on that film were undamaged. The only one that was affected was disc number five, the one that was left under the telephone. Well, I'll try and load it, and uh, you'll see what happens. I think that uh, Mr. Manilow's agent has put the fluence on this one. It's a shame, because leaving a disc under a phone is actually quite an easy mistake to make. And look at that, there's no doubt about the results. Disc fault. Still, at least in this case, we do know why that happened. Sometimes you can be as careful as you like with your disc. No phones, fridges, beers, trains, anything like that, and you still get a disc fault. And as Murphy's Law would have it, it'll be a fault, an invaluable program, the very one that you can't afford to lose. Now, obviously a backup disc is a must, providing you don't go and do what we did and leave them both in the same box. But Graham, apart from good housekeeping advice, is there any way that you can actually recover material that, that's gone on a damaged disc? Fortunately, there is. There's various routines for various machines, but if you've got a BBC, there's an excellent package, Disc Doctor. Disc Doctor. What is it? OK, it's a ROM-based package to you and me. It's a chip you put in the machine. Mm -hmm. You access it via the keyboard. Yeah. And you can disassemble and put information back on the disc and repair it. Right. Is it easy to use? Um, it's not really for the absolute beginner. You need to know a bit about the hierarchy of discs and what you're doing. Yeah. A programme could take, you know, quite a several hours to recover. So a bit of know-how and a Disc Doctor, yeah. you'd be all right. What's the commonest problem with discs? Actually, it's not the discs. It's the disc drive. I mean, even, uh, even a brand new disk drive, would you have a problem 40 with? Forty percent of disk drives imported happen to have the mechanical alignment not set up. They're not calibrated. That's amazing. But this is a disk drive, a, a naked disk drive, without its clothes <laughs> Correct, on, so right. to speak. Let's you probably, have a look at it. You probably recognise it from the front. Um, the standard disk drive, it's quite a complex piece of mechanical hardware. Mm. Very basically, though, there's three things you need to concern yourself. There's the head, mm -hmm. moves in and out to read the disk, mm -hmm. and on the other side, that's the plated circuit motor that drives the disk round. Oh, it's fascinating to see it like that. But let's go back to this business about the manufacturers not feeling inclined to align the disk drives before they send them out on mm. the road. Why? Primarily, it takes an hour's, an hour's time of a mm. skilled engineer, plus quite expensive test equipment to set all the calibration up. So it's just not cost-effective? Not really, no. All right, what's your answer? You're looking smug, <laughs> so I know you've got one. Ho, ho. OK, we've got a programme, a computer, that emulates a laboratory. It mm. throws onto the screen this expensive laboratory, and it does it automatically. So it saves engineering time to set them up. So is this rather like sending your car in for one of those electronic services? Yes, computerized services? very much the same, yes. Yeah. And here you can see it running through the test automatically, telling you where you should be, what you should be doing, yeah. and you can see the limits of what you... And it's diagnosing what might be wrong with that disk Going through a complete test yeah. of all the mechanical... It's quick too, drive. isn't it? That was, what, 25, 30 seconds? 25, 30 yeah. seconds this takes, and when it's finished, it gives a print out of the results. What's that asterisk for? That asterisk there shows that it's failed a particular test. It's failed on... Additional speed, mm. so does that mean it's going around too fast or too slow? This one's going too slow and that arrow tells me that if I want to adjust it, move it to the right. Can you do it now? Easy, yes, OK. We're now going to look at that test that it failed at and mm. thrown on the screen is the results. And we'll adjust it to bring that fly Simple in. as that. And then you've got a, a visual display of actually what you're doing so you can centre it up. That's my healthy drive. Yeah. That's actually very impressive. It's a lot of machinery. What does it cost? Uh, the basic kit starts at £1,900 mm. and it's for all the reputable dealers in the, in the UK service centres, people selling disk drives, people importing them. Right, you said it. It's a good way for dealers and people in the trade to improve customer services. Graham, thank you very much. Thank you. Mac? Still trying to figure out why anybody would want to dump their discs in a barrel of beer. There must be a good reason. Now to telephones. If you want a new telephone, the choice is yours, whether you have a British Telecom standard phone or a phone with a computer, or is it a computer with a phone, or many of the other fancier ones that are appearing in the shops. This is one that I particularly fancied myself. It's rather a nice thing. It goes well with the office style and it actually does work. I've been told that I should consider very seriously whether I should buy one or not because our engineer Steve says it's made of very Mickey Mouse technology. Yes, I didn't think that would go down well. Well, there's already competition with regard to telephone hardware and eventually there'll be competition in the services offered, such as which company you use for long distance calls. Much of this increased choice will stem from the privatisation of B BT next week. In the United States, BT's equivalently recently lost its monopoly, and Freff has been looking at what happened there. It used to be simple in America. God was in his heaven and all was right with the world. IBM made computers, AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph, made telephones. And small companies like Apple supplied things that were beneath the big guy's notice, home computers and the lower end of the business automation marketplace. That's changed. Now here on Madison Avenue in New York City, Two information giants. On the left, 
AT&T in their new corporate headquarters. And on the right, IBM are battling it out for a bigger piece of the American information technology pie. Nowadays, more and more computers, large and small, communicate with each other over telephone lines, from town to town, across continents, even around the globe. Both companies know that a successful future means being in the personal computer business and in telecommunications, so each is now entering the other's territory. For decades, IBM has been the world's largest manufacturer of mainframes and mini-computers, but it was only recently that they launched the IBM Personal Computer for smoother scheduling, better planning. And is it coincidence or a slight dig at the opposition that they've called their latest machine the AT? It can help a manager excel and become a big wheel in the company. The IBM Personal Computer. See it at a store near you. IBM is already a telecommunications business. It sells equipment and has satellite and other links across the country. Significantly, it has recently proposed a deal with British Telecom. AT&T, the American equivalent of BT, with one million employees, once owned and ran almost the entire telephone network in America, a system that has, over the last 100 years, acquired an unrivaled reputation for technical efficiency and innovation. Although AT&T has done extensive research in the field of computers, it was forbidden by law until last year from directly selling computers or computer services. Now it can. But at what cost for it and its telephone customers? That's Golden Boy. He used to be on the roof of their corporate headquarters. In those days, AT&T was a monopoly. But recently it was broken up into smaller companies. And at the time in America, we didn't know what that would mean for its services or its future. As it happened, it allowed it to enter all kinds of new things, like personal computers. 71 years after Alexander Graham Bell uttered, Watson, come here, Bell Laboratories invented the transistor and ushered in the computer age. Gentlemen, we've done it. Well, Watson, watch us now. Introducing AT&T computers. Their computer, by the way, is actually made by Olivetti. And Watson was also the name of the founder of IBM, one more double meaning in the advertising war between the giants. Of course, AT&T still makes telephones. It's just that microprocessor technology has made them different. This part's pretty much the same. But this part does things my old phone would never have dreamed of doing. For example, these three orange keys can be pre-programmed emergency numbers. Police, fire, insurance. I can turn off the alarm. I can change its volume. Or I can press call timer here, and I can watch as it times my call and prevents me from spending too much money. If you want more than that in the phone, you can buy any one of several of these little cartridges which plug into the phone and enable you to customize the way it works. This one, for example, is an electronic desk calendar. With it in place, the phone will keep track of certain dates, special appointments, and allow you to leave notes for yourself and other people in the phone system. This part is an auto dialer that will hold 250 different names and numbers, making it possible to call someone as easily as this. Of course, the reason that AT&T is releasing these new products is because for the first time in their history, they're in a competitive free-for-all. There's all kinds of new gadgets popping up out there. You'll find them in the innumerable independent telephone shops which have sprung up across America, ready to sell you phones of all kinds. Most people these days are buying their own phones. Now, with an old AT&T phone, you knew exactly where you stood. By comparison, the choice in these shops is bewildering and the quality sometimes dubious. But never mind the quality, look at the number of features. No matter whose phone you decide to buy, when you make your call, you aren't necessarily dealing with AT&T. The regional Bell telephone companies are now independent of AT&T and each other. Confusingly, in this exchange in Burbank, California, the same operators are working local calls for Pacific Bell and long-distance calls for AT&T. And it's in those long-distance services, up until now AT&T's exclusive territory, that it has its greatest competition. Okay. Gracias. Adios. Well, competition in the long-distance market is growing by leaps and bounds. For example, in California, there are about 61 companies registered to uh, handle long-distance calling. Competition has brought new services, like view data and much greater complexity. This public phone offers you a choice of eight different long-distance carriers. But choice doesn't necessarily mean better service. 
We have more than 40,000 operators working throughout the country. Other companies don't have operators? There are some other competing long distance companies that do not. I see. What's your actual market share now that competition has opened up? We're estimating that our market share is about 57 percent. So it's not surprising that AT&T operators leave you no doubt who you're dealing with. Thank you, Dan, for using AT&T. Thank you very much. You have a nice day. AT&T feels at a disadvantage. It's forced to lease its lines to its competitors, often for lower rates than it must charge its own customers. And it was the profits from those lines that always subsidized local telephone service. As the competition heats up for the long-distance dollar, the price of a local call is rising fast. Nobody knows what ultimately is going to happen in terms of cost of service or quality of service. But I can tell you what it's doing to me, personally. First, I bought my own phone. It was much cheaper than leasing it. Secondly, my bill is a lot more confusing. Now, this is only one month's worth of calls, and while I use the phone more than most people, still, it's, it's 22 pages, and it's very difficult to follow. To try and cut down on my long-distance costs, I took on one of the alternative long-distance lines, get the savings. But to use it, I have to dial a 23-digit number, and that means also I get a second phone bill every month from them. Now, the big problem is service. If it breaks down, the phone line or the telephone itself, I have to pay to have it repaired, and just finding out which one is broken is a very difficult, time-consuming, and potentially costly experience. Okay, thanks for using AT&T. Thank, thank, oh, thank you for calling AT&T. Oh, thank you for calling AT&T. One moment. We're deluged with advertising. Everybody's out to get us to use their service instead of the other guys. And the last is that all of these services have to work together. That means that the system is becoming increasingly complex, and therefore more vulnerable to the possible computer pranks or crimes that are becoming more common in today's society. All of this, pro and con, is the price we're paying in America for the breakup of AT&T that was necessary to allow them to enter the business of selling computers. Well, I look forward to the day when I hear a BT telecom operator say, thank you for calling British Telecom. Well, with me is Peter Keane from the Oxford Management Centre, who spent at least half of his time in the United States, and Brian Carsberg, the director of Oftel, the government's telecommunications watchdog, which actually stopped the proposed link between IBM and British Telecom, which Fred mentioned. Brian, do you think we're going to see this sort of confusion in Britain happening in the United States? No, I don't. In, in the United States, the company AT&T was broken up, and BT has not been broken up, so one important source of confusion has been removed. There will be a competitor in Britain, of course, Mercury, and people will be able to deal with them. And that will create a little extra complexity, but nothing like the situation in America, I would think. Peter, can you see that sort of confusion happening? Not so much confusion, but uh, certainly competition. Uh, we're going to see IBM and AT&T competing here. Uh, that's now a worldwide or geopolitical battle. And it's David versus Goliath, and no one's quite sure which is which. Certainly, AT&T intends to try and fight it out in international markets, where it doesn't have market share to lose. Or to protect. You're battling against an enormous giant, your Oftel. And mm -hmm. It's two and a half, two, 250,000 employees in British Telecom. You have, what, about 50. How can you hope to keep them under some sort of control? We shall have a few more than 50, actually, but that's not the main point. Uh, I think it's a mistake to believe that you need numbers in proportion to the people you're controlling. Uh, what you need for control purposes is two things. First of all, you need a good system to find out what's going on, and Secondly, you need strong powers to do something if you find the wrong things are going on. And I think we have both those, so I think we'll be all right on that score. I can see the increased competition from America for the businessman with large volumes of data yeah. between computers. Um, but for the private individual, surely they'll start dropping these remote uh, public telephone boxes which are not economic. Uh, can you control that and stop them from doing it? Yes. Uh, BT is operating under a license now, and that license uh, gives them some social obligations. And one of those is they have to keep uh, public call boxes in existence except under closely defined conditions. So I don't think you need to worry that all the telephone kiosks are going to be disappearing. How is the AT, Peter, how is the AT&T and IBM competition going to affect us in this country? First of all, I think it's going to put a lot more pressure on BT just to respond to demands for service, basic service. After all, the privatization or liberalization of BT is really creating what AT&T used to be. And it's still a very efficient company. There'll be demand for service. The other is certainly all the American companies and the European companies are looking for hookups with BT, with, with other organizations. So my guess is you're going to see a very volatile period, which will look like the time of the micros. I mean, who would have guessed we'd be seeing this three years ago? 
We see that AT&T have linked with Olivetti in producing their micro. Do you see British Telecom doing a similar sort of well, thing? Well, the, the, the attempt to link up with IBM. Um, I think it's going to be very unpredictable. Uh, AT&T is linked up with Japanese companies, which puts IBM in. Uh, IBM is linked up with Rome. Uh, certainly BTI is very aggressive internationally. And the British manufacturers have got to make sure they compete in the key Asian markets, uh, the Indian market, which is beginning to open up. And I think every single computer vendor will be looking for a communications vendor. And BT is sitting on a very interesting thing called Greenwich Mean Time. It really is the, the center of world communications for time windows. So that little chink, which is opening up BT to expectations of competition, I think would create a tremendous number of pressures. And I'd expect to see a much faster response. Brian, could we imagine a fall off in standards with increased competition in BT? No, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I, there are uh, uh, stringent standards in force as far as uh, apparatus connection to the network is concerned. That would be the main thing to create problems. If uh, substandard apparatus was being connected, then the network itself might suffer. But we have rules in process progress to, uh, to eliminate that danger, I think. If I run into problems with British Telecom, can I come to Ofttel and complain to you? Yes, you can. I'm, the first thing to do in most cases is to get in touch with British Telecom and see if they can help, because it's their primary responsibility. But we've got a large staff that are available to deal with complaints, and we're ready to act as a sort of referee. If you can't get satisfaction from British Telecom, come to us. Mm -hmm. Take us out five or six years in the future. How do you think it's going to change for the private individual and the company? Well, I think as far as the private individual is concerned, uh, the main effect will be, sh be seen in apparatus that's available. Uh, competition has already transformed the apparatus that's available in the home. I and mean, if you think of the old-fashioned receiver and think how that has changed, then that'll go on. Uh, and, uh, but as far as the competing companies for calls are concerned, I don't think very much more is likely to change over the next five years except the arrival of Mercury. For businesses, the competition will have a much bigger impact. And uh, one of my chief jobs is to promote competition to make sure that businesses get as much benefit from that as possible. Well, I hope you push it hard. Whatever the future holds, it's sure to be interesting. Thank you very much, Peter Keane and Brian Carsberg. We've had quite a few inquiries about what our bulletin board actually is and what sort of equipment you need to be able to get in touch with it. Well, this is a similar setup to the one that we've got currently running in the office, and on it are the messages that you send to us and the notes from the current programme that we leave there for you to read if you want to. Now, just to prove that it's very user-friendly and we're very fair, there's a message there at the moment from Thames TV's database team. They're asking for new ideas for their next series. They're not going to get any ideas from us, but fair's fair, I've read the message out. They're going to get um, a MicroLive T-shirt. Why not? Well, remember, to communicate with this system, you need a computer, a telephone, and a modem. And it must be a 300 stroke 300 bird modem. All the details of the operation are in these program notes, which uh, we can send you if you want them. And the bulletin board phone number is 01579. 2288. But do be patient. Remember, only one person can get on the system at a time. Uh, it will be you very soon. Well, if you're using a micro for a serious purpose, there are a number of packages you can get for many machines which will help you. On the BBC Micro, for instance, we've got a uh, graphics package here. We've got uh, work processing, so make typing letters much easier. You don't have to retype them if you make mistakes. We've got a spreadsheet system which allows you to model your company do investment appraisals and so on and we've got a database program which allows you to look at various people and analyze data in different ways and sort it the problem is that you probably bought these packages at different times in different places quite separately and they won't link together they've all got their different sets of commands and it's very difficult to get data which being fed in one program to run in another so although you could do separate tasks you can't combine them but to do that you need what's known as integrated software software that's designed as one system where everything links together. Well, this kind of software can cost anything up to £600 and it usually operates on much larger micros, sometimes ten times the memory capacity of a home micro. Well, let's look at the principles behind this integrated software. I put up a little database here, it's only four people, there's a name and their address and we have their total sales here and that's the using the database part of the package. Here we've got the little spreadsheet, it just takes the June sales and totals them up for the total sales and then it will write a letter to each of the people in the database congratulating them on their magnificent sales. And we get a little pie chart here with the four people showing how they've done and the person who sold the most coming 
not here. Now, the, the whole purpose of integration is if you change one of these things, it will automatically go through all these four applications, and I'm going to, to do that. And I'm going to go to Leslie, and she's done very well this month, and I'm going to give her sales of 7,000. Well done, Leslie. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, off we go. So it's immediately it starts to redraw the pie, sh pie chart. We can see that Leslie's already been separated out as the largest seller. It's taken her number, put in here 7,000 and added it to the total and here we are dear Leslie congratulations on magnificent poems in June with total sales of 7,000 regards Peter well we thought we'd give some of you an opportunity to put this product to the test and tell us what you think of it the company who wrote it have offered to give away three different business micros and they are the IBM PC the Apricot and a compact so they're all worth well over 2,000 pounds they're going to give away some their free software which is very substantial and they're going to give training and this is going to be given to the people who give the most interesting and original idea for its use in their everyday work or it could be running a club or a hobby you don't even need to have touched a computer before so if you've got an idea for a practical use of a micro using this software write to us for details we'll be following the lucky three to see whether the claims made for the product are justified and how easy they really found it to use mark your envelope clearly integrated software we in MicroLive will be the judges of who the three are based on how interesting and how suitable we think your ideas are. Leslie. <laughs> well, I must say I quite like it, Matt, because it seems to have made me make a profit. I like anything like that. Well, among the other exciting packages which arrived in the MicroLive office this week was an online handbook which gives you all the information about uh, things to know when you're using your computer along with your modem uh, on how to contact databases and also... A magazine, this is a new magazine being published this week, it's called Telelink, and it's got quite a useful section here. Here we are. Uh, free programmes that you can dial into. Mind you, our very own MicroLive bulletin board programme isn't mentioned yet, shame, but no doubt it'll be in next month's issue. And there's also news this month of two new databases which you can reach by phone. Two days ago, Times Newspapers launched an information service for schools which will enable school children to interrogate a large database and then send messages to each other. All those school kids, can you imagine? Of course, this would create mammoth phone bills, but British Telecom have agreed to charge an all-in price of £69 a term for the use of the service, including the calls. And then the Times are supplying some of the modems at about a third of the price, which is generous, but why? Well, the Times see the project as a trial for other groups who might like to find information quickly, like doctors, dentists, architects, you name the Times are looking at them, and they'll be charging them at full whack. Now, there's news also of another service for those of you on Telecom Gold. It's an electronic version of the Informatics Daily Bulletin, which up till now has been available by post on prescription. On, on prescription? It is not a prescription. By subscription. It provides up-to-the-minute intelligence about the computer world. But besides getting the latest bulletin, you can also actually dial in and research any subject you want. For instance, if I want to know how many times IBM, ATT and Olivetti have been mentioned all at once, I've asked it to find out. It's four occurrences. Uh, so I think what I'll do, since there's only four, to give you an example, I will scan it. There we are. And this will go on and find, it should do, the first lines of the four different references to IBM, ATT and Olivetti. Three you reasons you wanted there. to scan it is you could have had a hundred references there and if you had to read them all before you got to the one that you wanted to, it Take would be an absolute time. nightmare. It would, wouldn't, wouldn't it? it? Terrible. Absolutely. You can imagine what it's like. But it's, it's, the great thing you have to do is to use the service very carefully. The information might be invaluable, but the rate is £40 an hour. It is indeed. So we'd better switch it off, Mac. Well, that's the end of this show. The next one is on Friday, the 7th of December. Yes, and don't miss the earliest high-technology Christmas party on television. Bye-bye.